This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. For Hack 5, I'm Darren Kitchen here at RSA 2012, talking to Charles over at Telesign. How are you, Charles? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. There's a little phone freak inside of me that gets really excited when we start talking about a and and stuff. So what is the back of the book? How does this technology work? So basically, what Telesign does is we enable things like two-factor authentication for our customers. What we also do is a customer can pass us a phone number, and we can tell them something about that phone number. So something that we'd be able to tell them about is like, what kind of phone is it? So is it a VoIP phone? Is it a, if it's a VoIP phone, is it a fixed VoIP or a non-fixed VoIP? Is it a Vonage phone, or is it a Google Voice phone? And based on that, our customers can kind of make a determination what they want to do. You know, is there a chance, a bigger or lower chance of fraud based on that? Oh, that's fascinating. So I understand, like, you know, for any of those places where I sign in, I sign up, and I have to give it a phone number so that if I lose my password or is it a second factor of authentication, they'll text me a code that I, you know, put onto their website somehow. Uh, you're able to actually tell what kind of number that is. And, and is that because, of, is there like a database of DIDs where you can say like, oh, this is an asterisk. Like, how would you, how would you tell if something is an asterisk box where some BSD hippie put something together? Sure. Not that there's anything wrong with BSD hippies, I'm just saying. Yeah. So, there are publicly available data sources and there's privately available data sources. What's really interesting though, and I'll use TrackPhone as an example. TrackPhone is a type of uh, prepaid mobile that you can buy at like Walmart or something like that. It's awesome if you're a crack dealer. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so when you get a TrackPhone initially, before it actually becomes a TrackPhone, it's an AT&T landline. TrackPhone is what's known as an MVNO, a mobile virtual network operator, and they actually have to register that the second that like, you buy it and you start using it. We have access to that database in real time so that when it goes from being an AT&T landline, which is typically considered a very high quality, to something like a prepaid mobile, which is okay, but maybe something we want to take a little bit of a closer look at, we can tell that in real time. That's really fascinating. And you were saying that you were actually able to, depending on if it's a prepaid or a postpaid, tell credit? How are you able to do that? So right now, not in the United States, but internationally, if it's a GSM phone and it's connected to the SS7 network, which they all are, if I'm making a call into a prepaid mobile, if you think about it, before the call gets to you, you know, the carrier needs to make sure that you actually have credit on the phone, otherwise your phone's not going to ring. And so using that mechanism, we can actually tell if the phone has credit on it or not. Some of the things that we believe we can get in a little bit, you know, probably later in this year, next year, is also how long have you had that number? Also super interesting. So, you know, if you say, okay, here's a prepaid mobile, there's $100 in credit on it, the person's had it for three years, probably not a fraudster, probably not a fraudster. If you bought it yesterday, if there's five pounds of credit on it or something, you know, not necessarily a fraudster, but maybe we should be a little bit more careful. And, uh, well, first of all, how are you able to find that out? Is this when you call them, when they call you? Where is this data transmitted? So this is happening over the SS7 network. So we can actually ping the phone over SS7 without making a phone call, and we can determine something about it. Is this like dialing and hanging up before first ring or something? No, 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 nothing like that at all. I mean, it's a, it's a signaling thing. So for example, I'll give you an, an SMS example. When an SMS is placed, there's actually something that happens before you get the SMS that uh, determines where that phone is. And when you do that, you also get things off that device. So for example, you'll get the IMSI off the device, which is the, the system identifier on the chip. The, the, the MSI? The uh, IMSI, yeah. So you get that when uh, the carrier gets that as part you don't get, uh, uh, You don't get a temporary one? Uh, n in most cases, you don't. It is possible to get a temporary one, but in most cases, you get that. Now, the thing you can also get, and this is a lot of times blocked by carriers, but by many it's not, is getting things like the IMEI over the SS7 network. It's super interesting to take a look at IMSI and IMEI and the relationship between those two things. Now. There are interesting ways around this from a fraudster perspective, but you know it's just more data. And actually, actually, just that alone sounds like something that would be interesting for a fraudster, data mining, things of that nature. And that's publicly. How do you how do you go about doing that? Well, so they um, is that something you need a relationship with the carrier for? That's right. Yeah. I mean, unless you have an SS7 connection, which is very hard to get, you can't get it. So we have basically partners we're working with VU where we can get that data through them and you know use those as fraud signals. Awesome. And so let me think about this as like the consumer side. It, do I use this to make sure that my eBay purchase isn't through some guy that just bought a phone yesterday or what? Sure. Well, it'd be more like eBay would basically use it in to protect their customers and to protect their users. So verifying the user using a two-factor authentication, verifying the phone, determining, you know, is that a phone actually belonged to a person or is it potentially a fraudster? And so we're what's kind of known as a, a B2B2C company where you know we have a relationship with another business and that business has customers and we help that business protect their customers. That's really interesting stuff. Where can people go and learn more about Telesign? So they can go to Telesign.com, www, and they can learn about us. And uh, they can also, you know, we have seven of the 10 biggest uh, websites in the world actually are using our product today. So if you're doing a phone uh, pin verification today, it's probably going through us. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Charles. Great. Thank you. 
Hack 5's 11th season is here and we are so happy to let you guys know that Domain.com has now been sponsoring us for three years. They are our favorite domain registrar and the truth is we couldn't be happier with them. In fact, Hack5.org is running on them right now. Check this out, find new domain names, add new domains to your portfolio, manage your company's domains, do a little hacking. We love Domain.com. If you need a host for your website, you can also set that up so quickly and easily. WordPress, Joomla installers, real simple, plus a bunch of other programs super easily. And get this, the women over at Domain.com. Yeah, they're huge fans of Hack5 too. I'm not kidding. In fact, if you tweet at Domain.com's Twitter and let them know that you're friends of Hack5, you might be lucky and get yourself a nice little cool Domain.com t-shirt. I'm serious, try it out. Don't forget, when you're at Domain.com, buying domain names, transferring your existing ones to them, use the coupon code HAK5 at checkout, save yourself an extra 15%. When you think domain names, think Domain.com. Hey guys, Shannon Morris from RSA, and I'm over here with Rich Murphy at One Login. One login. Okay, I've never heard of this, but my first thought is passwords. What does one login do? So we do single sign-on in the cloud, so web-based only, and uh, we don't have any hardware or software necessary, which is absolutely brand new, and uh, it's really exciting because it's inexpensive and very, very easy to do. So it's sort of the cloud of the cloud version of single sign-on. Okay, so is this anything like? last pass or one password or any of those? Yes, there is there are some similarities in that yes, we'll help you, you know, you only have to have one password. But LastPass is really consumer oriented and it's um, not necessarily secure for the enterprise because the password is actually stored, you know, on the computer. So it's better than putting it on a sticky note or in a uh, spreadsheet, but it really wouldn't pass the test for us. We use SAML and we are a trusted provider. Okay, so tell me a little bit about how this exactly works. Sure, just on a, at a basic level, the way it works is you, when you use SAML, a SAML assertion, you don't have to have an actual uh, credential with the app in question, say Salesforce or Zendesk or even a home-built app that runs in a browser. You, you don't need that password won't exist there. We will uh, manage that for you and you, we will be the trusted provider. So you can't get into the app without one login and you uh, all the password policies are set by the administrator and it's, it's very secure and very easy. Okay, so do I have to, um, I heard that this you could use this with like a cell phone, you can log in with an app or something like that? Well, we support multi-factor authentication, which means that you can have a one-time password. And um, one of the things that's really cool about our service is we support tons of different uh, methodologies for that. So you can have a hard token like an RSA token or a soft token uh, that exists on your mobile phone. We have our own, which is free, bundled into our service. But we also support VeriSign and other, other, you know, other options as well. So could I use this with like a YubiKey, for example? Absolutely, we support YubiKey. That's awesome, very cool. Yeah, this kind of reminds me of um, Google two-factor authentication in a sense. Now, what if I don't have um, a web interface on my phone? I can't access the internet from my phone and I want to use that one login. What do I do then? Well, you don't have to have two-factor authentication. So you could simply go to your you know, landing, a, a landing page on the web and log in with your name and password. The administrator can set up two-factor, multi-factor authentication if they choose. So the answer is, if you don't, you don't have to have a, a you know, a one-time password if you don't want it. Oh, that's perfect. Now back here it says you have 300 plus customers. Is that the companies that One Login works with, or is this the people that have signed up with your, with your One Login? So yes, it, it's absolutely a business-to-business -business kind of product. So. Our customers are companies like Netflix and Steelcase and, and AAA, and, but also tons of smaller companies as well. Um, it's, the thing that's nice about the cloud is it's so easy to do. So uh, at one time, you know, this is, was just closed off to medium and small companies. It's just too much work. But with us, you can get this thing going in, you know, like an hour. Really? It's that easy to set up? It really is. We have a connector to any type of user store like an LDAP server or Active Directory. It's super easy to get that going. It takes minutes. And then once you have the connector done and your user store is connected to one login, you know, you can federate. You, you basically add, you know, your apps and uh, that's it. Now, if somebody isn't one of your customers, they're not listed as one of your 300 plus co companies that it works with, would I still be able to use one login with them or do I have to wait? 
So if you, uh, we don't have a consumer version of this. So it, you can, anyone can sign up for a trial. In fact, that's how most of our, uh, that's how we usually do business. Someone signs up for a trial, they get the thing implemented, and then they decide they just want to pay us. Uh, so it's that simple. So anyone can sign up for a trial, and you can use it yourself as a consumer. It's really focused, though, on businesses. Very cool. Well, thank you, Rich. Uh, one last question for you. Where can people find more information, and how much does it cost? Um, yeah, onelogin.com, one login, all spelled out, .com will get you there. Uh, for our, uh, the, actually, the smaller, the you know, typical volume pricing, so it's about $5 a user per month that it's most expensive. But then, but then as you add users and maybe, you know, it, it goes down quite a bit, so. Awesome, thank you so much, Rich. It was great to talk to you. And for more information and conference coverage over at RSA, you can check out hack5.org.